Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India From here onward, what kind of intended and unintended consequences of social action that we have, so far as the relationship between technology and politics is concerned. This is very important. In controversies about technology and society, there is no idea more provocative than the notion that technical things have political qualities. At issue is the claim that the machines, structures and systems of modern material culture can be accurately judged not only for their contributions of efficiency and productivity, not merely for their positive and negative environmental side effects, but also for the ways in which they can embody specific forms of power and authority. It is very important. Okay? Then if I say that uh, uh, the manifest functions of, of such machines, uh, structures and systems of modern material culture can be accurately judged only in terms of their contributions of efficiency and productivity, only in terms of their positive and negative environmental side effects, then the latent functions of these machines, structures and systems of modern material culture the way they embody specific forms of power and authority must be uh, uh, emphasized. Okay? As we have already discussed, uh, there is a subtle difference between power and authority. Authority is leg legal, whereas power is illegal in, uh, in sociology, uh, but we are not going to discuss that much, okay? uh, because our, our, our uh, go goal here, uh, the kind of instrumental rationality that we are engaged in okay, does not uh, allow us to move beyond our course, because of certain uh, limitations, uh, because you have to complete this uh, the, uh, the lectures within, uh, within a time frame. Uh, and uh, I am sure students uh, participants must uh, um, uh, immensely benefit from this kind of engagement. Uh, if you look at this, since ideas of such kind, ideas of such manifest and latent functions of machines, structures and systems of modern material culture, okay, then under manifest functions of machines, structures and systems of modern material culture, we are putting efficiency and productivity, positive and negative environmental side effects and so on. And latent functions, we, may, we, are, we are trying to emphasize on the fact that that the machine structures and systems of modern material culture embody specific specific forms of power and authority. Since ideas of this kind have a persistent and troubling presence in discussions about the meaning of technology, they deserve explicit attention. Writing in technology and culture almost a couple of, I mean almost uh, um, I mean in the, in the 60s or so, uh, 50s, 60s. Uh, Mumford gave a classic uh, statement to one version of the theme, arguing that from late Neolithic times in the Near East, right down to our own day, two technologies have recurrently existed side by side, one authoritarian, the other democratic. The first system centered, immensely powerful, but inherently unstable. The other human centered, relatively weak, but resourceful and durable. Then two types of technology Mumford was referring to, one authoritarian to democratic. Authoritarian technology according to uh, Martin is system centered, immensely powerful, but inherently unstable, because it is not democratic. 
the other democratic technology which is human centered relatively weak, but resourceful and durable and hence sustainable. You can look at many many technologies in this context and such argument stands at the heart of Mumford's studies of the city architecture and the history of techniques and mirrors concerns voiced earlier in the works of Kropotkin, uh, uh, Morris and other 19th century critics of industriality. More recently, you will find anti nuclear and pro solar energy movements in Europe and America have adopted a similar notion as a centerpiece in their arguments. Thus, environmentalist uh, Dennis Hess concludes, let me quote Hess here, the increased deployment of nuclear power facilities must lead society towards authoritarianism. Indeed, self -re uh, safe reliance upon nuclear power as the principal source of energy may be possible only in a totalitarian state. Echoing the views of many proponents of appropriate technology and the soft energy path has contains that dispersed solar sources are more compatible than centralized technologies with social equity, freedom and cultural pluralism. This is these, these are very important. Then what we saw first? that in the form of authoritarian and democratic technologies okay? or you uh, uh, suppose uh, the kind of uh, environmental movements that we um, uh, see in the context of uh, Narmada Bachao Andolan, um, uh, maybe in the context of uh, in the northeast that we see uh, uh, the construction of see in the form of construction of uh, Subansiri Dam and so on, what we find that they have become a part of authoritarian technologies. They are immensely, they are, they are immensely powerful, they are system centered, they are because they are supported by the state, by the government, by a political institution, but inherently unstable. Okay? And here, what we find that uh, the use of nuclear power, nuclear energy that we see, the use of nuclear weapons that we see, okay, it has deterring effects on civilization, on our safety, our security, on our existence of being, on, on the essence of being, on the reason of our existence, on the reason of our being. Okay. As a consequence, that is why uh, uh, some time back we discussed you know, that uh, uh, if you look at uh, the way uh, we in India we uh, carry out uh, nuclear tests, okay. is it a scientific question or a political question? Okay. That is why we very often say that uh, it is an alliance between science and politics, uh, maybe at times there, is, there are disagreements even uh, within the political establishments as well as within the scientific establishments and so on. But what we what we try to what we intend to discuss here that how even in India extending the discussion from Europe and America, how anti nuclear and pro solar energy movements are taking roots in even in India. Okay? That's why uh, I was. Uh, that's why uh, Langdon Wiener tried to quote Hess that the increased deployment of nuclear power facilities must lead society towards authoritarianism. Indeed, safe reliance upon nuclear power as the principal source of energy may be possible only in a totalitarian state. Echoing the views of many proponents of appropriate technology. Uh, including Sumakar, okay? small is beautiful, E. F. Sumakar wrote, right? appropriate technology and the soft energy path has contains that dispersed solar sources are more compatible than centralized technologies with social equity, freedom and cultural pluralism. Whenever we try to design a technology, we must keep at least three things in mind that social equity, freedom and cultural pluralism. And eagerness 
to interpret technical artifacts in political language is by no means the exclusive property of critics of large scale high technology systems. A long lineage of boosters have insisted that the biggest and best that science and industry made available were the best guarantees of democracy, freedom and social justice. The factory system, automobile, telephone, radio, television, the space program and of course, nuclear power themselves have all at one time or another been described as democratizing liberating forces, which they are not. Okay? That is why uh, uh, um, I was referring to uh, some time back that one must watch uh, Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin um, and others. I mean, oh, one can read Critique of Everyday Life by Henry Lefebvre and so on. If you look at this, even, even uh, one can look at uh, uh, The City by uh, Jimmel and George Jimmel and so on. If you look at this, how the, the, the state propagated technological systems that know the, the biggest, the best uh, that uh, uh, if you have to have, if you want to make development possible, then you must have factory system, automobile, telephone, radio, television, the space program and of course, nuclear power, okay? because they were considered and today also by the state they are considered uh, 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 democratizing uh, uh, liberating forces. Okay. But to what extent they are democratizing and liberating forces is uh, must be interrogated, uh, must be uh, questioned, okay. uh, because the, the kind of human alienation that we have witnessed because of mindless industrialization okay, uh, in Europe and uh, North America and so on. Okay. It has led human civilization okay, uh, to more inhuman, more anti-democratic, undemocratic uh, situations. Okay. In this sense, uh, in this sense, the, we must bring about uh, uh, we must bring about an organized critique to such view that the factory system, automobile, telephone, radio, television, the space program and of course, nuclear power themselves have all um, at one time or another been described as democratic, democratizing or liberating forces. Lilienthal, uh, uh, according to Lilienthal, uh, uh, democracy on the march for example, found this promise in the uh, phosphate. Uh, fertilizers and electricity that technical progress was bringing to rural Americans during the 1940s. In, a, in, a, in an essay, the Republic of Technology boosted in extolled television for its power to disband uh, armies, to cashier presidents, to create a whole new democratic world, democratic in ways never before imagined even in America. Scarcely a new invention comes along that someone does not proclaim it in the salvation of a free society. Then in the context of such factory system, automobile, telephone, radio, television, the space program and of course, of course, we, we require those things, but at what cost. Okay? Uh, in, in such contexts, what kind of a free, open, democratic society we are going to have. Okay? This is very important. It is no surprise to learn that technical systems of various kinds are deeply interwoven in the conditions of modern politics. The physical arrangements of industrial production, warfare, communications and the like have fundamentally changed the exercise of power and the experience of citizenship. But to go beyond this obvious fact and to argue that certain technologies in themselves have political properties, seems at first place completely mistaken. We all know that people have politics, not things. That is what uh, Landon Weiner challenged that no, even, even things, even artifacts, even technologies, they also have political, uh, they, have, they have 
uh, they possess they, they are inherently political uh, in nature. To discover either virtues or evils in aggregates of steel, plastic, transistors, uh, integrated circuits and chemicals seems just plain wrong a way of mystifying human uh, attify uh, and of avoiding the true sources the human sources of freedom and oppression justice and injustice. Blaming the hardware appears even more foolish than blaming the victims when it comes to judging conditions of public life. Hence, the stern advice commonly given to those who flirt with the notion that technical artifacts have political qualities. Here, the most important thing in this article, in the central argument of this article is that what matters is not technology itself, but the social or economic system in which it is embedded. And I repeat what matters is not technology itself, but the social or economic system in which it is embedded such maxim, which in a number of variations is the central premise of a theory that can be called the social determination of technology has an obvious wisdom. It serves as a needed corrective to those uh, who focus uncritically on such things as the computer and its social impacts, but who fail to look behind technical things to notice the social circumstances of their development, deployment and use. Then what comes to our point of discussion now? that what matters is not technology itself, but the social or economic system in which it is embedded. I mean it is a uh, rebuff to technological deterministic stance that that, uh, that, that that serves as a needed corrective to those who focus uncritically on such things as the computer and its social impacts, okay? but who fail to look behind technical things to notice the social circumstances of their development, deployment and use. When we say the computer and its impact, social impacts, it is the it is the society which has created the computer, it is not the computer which has created the society. Okay? That that is a problem with the proponents of technological determinism. This view provides an antidote to naive technological determinism. The idea that technology develops as the sole result of an internal dynamic and then unmediated by any other influence molds society to it to fit its patterns and those who have not recognized the ways in which technologies are shaped by social and economic forces have not gotten very far. Then what is te technological determinism? That technological determinism refers to the idea that technology develops as the sole result of an internal dynamic and then unmediated by any other influence mold society to fit its patterns. Okay? And that is why uh, uh, those proponents of technological determinism often refer to the fact that uh, often refer to the statements like the computer and its social impacts. Okay? This is important, I mean this is a rebuff to that kind of thinking that uh, no, it is not the technology which has created our economy, culture and polity, but it is our economy, culture and polity which has which have been able to uh, say what kind of technology we are going to have. Okay? But the corrective has its own shortcomings. If I say that no, only economy, culture and polity, only society has created this. It also has its own shortcomings taken literally, it suggests that technical things do not matter at all. Once one has done the detective work uh, necessary to reveal the social origins, power holders behind a particular instance of technological change, one will have explained everything of importance. This conclusion offers comfort to social scientists. It validates what they had, had always suspected, namely that there is nothing distinctive about the study of technology in the first place, which is equally wrong which is equally an extreme, which is equally wrong. Hence, they can return to their standard models of social power, those of interest group politics, bureaucratic politics, Marxist models of class struggle and the like and have everything they need. The social determination of technology is a, in this view essentially 
is no different from the social determination of say welfare policy or taxes. That is why when we talk about uh, the relationship between technology and politics, we must look at we must go beyond these two extremes that is technological deterministic view as well as the social deterministic view. There are however, good reasons technology that technology has of late taken on a special fascination in its own right for historians, philosophers and political scientists, sociologists for good reasons that the standard models of social science only go so far in accounting for what is most interesting and troublesome about the subject. In another place, Winner has tried to show why so much of modern political, social and political thought contains recurring statements of what can be called a theory of technological politics, an odd mongrel of notions often crossbred with orthodox liberal conservative and socialist philosophies. The theory of technological politics draws attention to the momentum of, momentum of large scale socio technical systems to the response of modern societies to certain technological imperatives and to the all too common signs of the adaptation of human ends to technical means. In so doing, such framework offers a novel framework of interpretation and explanation for some of the more puzzling patterns that have taken shape in and around the growth of modern material culture. One strength of this point of view is that it takes technical artifacts seriously rather than insist that we must immediately reduce everything to the interplay of social forces. It suggests that we pay attention to the characteristics of technical objects and the meaning of those characteristics. A necessary complement to rather than uh, uh, replacement for theorize, theories of um, uh, theories of the social determination of technology, this perspective identifies certain technologies as political phenomena in their own right. It points us back to borrow Husserl's philosophical in injunction to the things themselves. It is very important Husserl's uh, term of to the things themselves. Okay. In what follows, winner tried to offer outlines and illustrations of two ways in which artifacts can contain political properties. First are instances in which the invention, design or arrangement of a uh, specific technical device or system becomes a way of settling an issue in a particular community. Seen in the proper light, examples of this kind are fairly straightforward and easily understood. Second are cases of what can be called inherently political technologies, man made systems that appear to require, I am trying to refi this, that, that appear to require or to be strongly compatible with particular kinds of political relationships. Arguments about cases of this kind are much more troublesome and closer to the heart of the matter. By politics, Wiener meant arrangements of power and authority in human associations as well as the activities that take place within those arrangements. For such purposes, technology here is understood to mean all of modern practical artifice and to avoid confusion, uh, Wiener preferred to speak of technology smaller or larger pieces or systems of hardware of a specific kind. His intention, his purpose is not to settle any of the issues here once and for all, but to indicate their general dimensions and significance. Technical arrangements as forms of order, then let us go one by one. Then first one is, uh, I mean is important that uh, first are the instances in which the invention, design or arrangement of a specific technical device or system becomes a way of settling an issue uh, in a particular community. And second are cases of what can be called inherently political technologies, man made systems that appear to require or to be strongly compatible with particular kinds of political relationships. Now, anyone who has travelled the highways of America 
we are going back i am i am just we are I'm, we are trying to go back a little that anyone who has traveled the highways of america and has become used to the normal height of overpasses may well find something like a like a little odd about this uh, about some bridge some of the bridges over the parkways on long island of new york many of the overpasses winner uh, points out that are extraordinarily low having as little as 9 feet of um, clearance at the curb even those who happen to notice the structural peculiarity would not be inclined to attach any special meaning to it in our accustomed way of looking at things like roads and bridges we see the details of form as innocuous and seldom give them a second thought it turns out however that the 200 or so low hanging overpasses on long island were deliberately designed to achieve a particular social effect robert mosses the master builder of roads parks bridges and other public works from the 1920s to the 1970s in new york had these overpasses built to specifications that would discourage the presence of buses on uh, on his parkways according to evidence provided by robert ek caro in his biography of mosses the reasons reflect mosses social class bias and racial prejudice automobile owning whites of upper and comfortable middle classes as he called them would be free to use the parkways i mean mosses used to call them uh, owning whites of Or, uh, upper and comfortable middle classes as he called them um, would be free to use the parkways for recreation and commuting poor people and blacks who normally used public transit were kept off the roads because the 12 foot uh, tall buses could not get through the, the overpasses one consequence was to limit access to racial minorities and low income groups to uh, jones beach mosses widely acclaimed public park mosses made doubly sure of this result by vetoing a proposed extension of the long island railroad to jones beach as a as a story in recent american political history uh, as as uh, 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 winner points out that mosses life is fascinating his dealings with mosses dealings with mayors governors and presidents and his careful manipulation of legislatures banks labor unions the press and public opinion are all matters that political scientists could study for years sociologists could study for years but the most important and enduring results of his work are his technologies the vast engineering projects that give new york much of its present form for generations after mosses has gone and the alliances he forged have fallen apart his public works especially the highways and bridges he built to favor the use of the, the automobile over the development of mass transit uh, will continue to save that city that's why in this context i gave you this such example like the way public roads in india are constructed they are essentially anti pedestrian many of uh, uh, mosses monumental structures of concrete and still uh, embody uh, uh, a systematic social inequality a way of engineering relationships among people that after a time becomes just another part of the landscape as planner uh, uh, lee um, copelman told caro that the new that the low bridges on uh, wantka parkway the the old son of a gun had made sure that buses would never be able to use his uh, gadament parkway histories of architecture city planning and public works contain many examples of physical arrangements that contain explicit or implicit political purposes one can point to baron hosman's broad uh, parisian uh, thoroughfares engineered at uh, louis uh, napoleon's direction to prevent any recurrence to street fighting of the kind that uh, took place during the revolution of 1848 or one can visit any number of grotesque uh, uh, concrete buildings and huge plazas constructed on american university campuses during the late 1960s and early 1970s to diffuse student demonstrations studies of industrial machines and instruments also turn up interesting political stories including some that violate our normal expectations about why technological innovations are made in the first place 
if we suppose that new technologies are introduced to achieve increased efficiency, the history of technology shows that we will sometimes be disappointed. Technological change expresses a panoply of human motives, not the least of which is the desire of some to have dominion of over others, even though it may require an occasional sacrifice of cost cutting and some violence to the norm of getting more from less. One poignant illustration can be found in the history of 19th century industrial mechanization. At Cyrus uh, uh, McCormick's uh, Reaper manufacturing plant in Chicago in the middle of 1880s, pneumatic holding machines a new and largely untested innovation were added to the foundry at an estimated cost of 5 lakh uh, uh, US dollars. In the standard economic interpretation of such things, we would expect that this step was taken to modernize the plant and achieve the kind of efficiencies that mechanization uh, uh, brings about. Okay? Uh, but historian Robert Ozen has shown why the development must be seen in a broader context. We will see. At the, uh, at the time, Cyrus uh, McCormick II uh, was engaged in a battle with a national union of uh, iron molders. McCormick II saw the addition of the new machines as a way to weed out the bad element among the men, namely the skilled workers who had organized a union local in Chicago. The new machines manned by unskilled labor actually produced inferior castings at a higher cost than the earlier process. After three years of use, the machines were in fact abandoned, but by that time they had served their purpose the destruction of the union itself. Thus, the story of these technical developments at the McCormick factory cannot be understood adequately outside the record of workers attempts to organize police repression of the uh, labor movement in Chicago during that period and the events surrounding the bombing at Hay Market Square. Technological history and the American political history were at that moment deeply intertwined. In cases like those of Moss's low bridges and McCormick's molding machines, one sees the importance of technical arrangements that precede the use of the things in question. It is obvious that technologies can be used in ways that enhance the power, authority and privilege of some over others. For example, the use of television to sell a candidate to our, to our, to our accustomed way of thinking technologies are seen as neutral tools that can be used well or poorly for good, evil or something in between. But we usually do not stop to inquire whether uh, a given device might have been designed and built in such a way uh, that it produces a set of consequences logically and temporarily, uh, temporarily prior to any of its professed uses. uses. Robert Moss's bridges after all were used to carry automobiles from one point to another, McCormick's uh, machines were used to make metal castings. Both technologies however, encompassed purposes far beyond their immediate use. If our moral and political language for evaluating technology includes only categories having to do with tools and uses, if it does not include attention to the meaning of the designs and arrangements of our artifacts, then we will be blinded to much that is intellectually and practically crucial. Because the point is most easily understood in the light of particular intentions embodied in physical form. Winner has so far offered illustrations that seem almost uh, conspiratorial for in winner's language, but to recognize the political dimensions in the shapes of technology does not require that we look for conscious conspiracies or malicious intentions. The organized movement of handicapped people in the US during the 1970s pointed out that the countless ways in which machines, instruments and structures of common use, buses, buildings, sidewalks, plumbing fixtures and so forth made it impossible for many handicapped persons to move, out, move about freely 
a condition that systematically excluded them from public life. Okay? It is safe to say that designs unsuited for the handicapped arose more from the long standing neglect than from anyone's active intention. But now that the issue has been raised for public attention, it is evident that justice requires a remedy. A whole range of artifacts are now being redesigned and rebuilt to accommodate this minority. Indeed, many of the most important examples of technologies that have political consequences and those that transcend the simple categories of intended and unintended altogether as we have uh, 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 discussed in the case of Weber as well as Mar and especially Martin. These are instances in which the very process of technical development is so thoroughly biased in a particular direction that it regularly produces results counted as wonderful breakthroughs by some social interests and crushing setbacks by others. In such cases, it is neither correct nor insightful to say someone intended to do somebody else harm. Rather, one must say that technological deck has been stacked long in advance in to favor certain uh, social interests and that some people were bound to receive a better help than others. 